So, uh, welcome to the Powax live stream, if I want to call it that. I don't really know. Um, uh, let me reply to this real quick. Sorry. So basically, in this live stream, for those of you who've never been into one of my live streams, one of my goals as a coach and just as a person um, is to improve my ability to repeat and understand the theories and things that I know or have learned about because I think that one of the things I struggle to do is convey ideas in a way where I actually finish the idea. I always get sidetracked into this and that. And so by doing a live stream where I am forced to rely on my own memory, I can then see where my errors lie and basically find out where when I have three more words left to say a specific thing to prove a point, it'll actually be the point I wanted to say. But so um, in relation to this live stream, a couple things really quick. First off, first I'm doing it on Twitter. What's up, Twitter world? Um, I've been trying to do more Twitter, more LinkedIn, just because I watch Gary V and he says it all the time just to do stuff, basically to put out as much content as you can so people, you're in the thing. And what's really cool is that it's actually been working very well. So one of my goals is basically just to try and help out as many coaches as I can and to continue conversations with as many people as I can to generate as much you know knowledge and help myself as well as help other people with their coaching and just overall stuff. But so one of the very cool things that happened over the course of the last week was um, Mark Millen actually commented on one of my Instagram posts. And if you don't know who Mark Millen is, that's Mark Millen. So that's pretty cool for Twitter. Yeah. So I basically have a poster of this guy and he's the guy who I watched growing up. Um, he was an, I believe he was playing in the very first MLL season, you know, MVP of this and that. And he, he made a, a videotape for those of us who remember videotapes called Mark Millen's Offensive Wizardry. And so he basically taught how to play like he does. And I remember watching this thing over and over and over and over in my basement, trying to mimic what he did and then taking it out to the field and practicing it and doing it, you know, doing the exact same things he did. So that's very, very cool. Um, the funny part about the fact that he did comment was that he commented, you know, nice poster. And so he commented about himself in my thing, which I think is just hilarious, but very, very cool. Now, all I need is just, uh, let's see which side would it be, Jesse Hubbard. So I also have the Jesse Hubbard poster. That one's really cool because that's a picture of him when he played at Princeton. And apparently they had to stop play for, I guess, six times to find the ball, which I thought was very cool because it was so muddy and rainy and whatnot. Um, and so let me re-put this up here. So I always have trouble with my phone live stream. So a couple other little updates and then we're going to get into uh, the talent code. Another thing, thank you for everybody who watched the two man game video. Um, I'm actually, so the video actually has over a thousand views within a week, which is by far the best initial opening video that I've ever had. And it's, we're not even in season. So that's pretty rare. I think that, you know, as the season hits, I don't really produce much because I'm coaching so much and I have to put all of my energy into scouting and to practice planning and to just really knowing what's going on with our team. So even though I don't really put out much content, then I'm really excited and proud that the two man game video has over a thousand views within a week because that's, it's just awesome. And I really hope that the links in the bottom really help because they will let you skip from place to place. And I hope the linear idea of it, you know, you kind of know what you're getting when you click in either spot. So next final update is like I just mentioned, I'm trying to do more content on LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. So make sure you follow me or Powlax in all of those places. Um, I think that it's very cool to, see the differences in how people act on each site. I'm trying to put different things in different places for those audiences, but overall I'm really just 
trying to, you know, see where it is. So I guess LinkedIn's more professional. Oh, that's the other thing. So as you follow me on these places, if you follow Palax on Facebook or me on LinkedIn or wherever, if there's a place to do a review and you like the Palax content or you like my content on, on LinkedIn, because I guess, I mean, they're the same thing really. Definitely leave a review. If you like it, it'll help me out a ton. I know a lot of people rely on those reviews. And so if, you know, if you've benefited from the content or you really kind of like what that is, please leave a review. Um, I think that's it for that. So yeah, now we're going to get into the talent code. And once again, this whole live stream idea is for you in a sense that you can watch me struggle through this because I'm not very good at doing these live streams yet. I will be, but I think I have to kind of go over. I really have to find my mentions. So if you, if you know anyone who has their speeches and they do them very well, there's one thing that really, that, that every one of them does. They have their points that they go through and they hit them over and over and over again. And it's funny because Gary V talks about it and he's like, he talks about people who hate on him on Twitter or other places. And they say, Gary V, you know, you're such BS. You say the same thing over and over and over again. And he's like, what do you want from me? That's the answer. Do you want me to tell you, you mean to make stuff up and lie about it? Like that's the answer. So I think I really want to develop and find my truth out of all of these things so that I can then influence that basically that I have my points that I'll hit as I'm trying to discuss separate topics. So I think that part of those things is going to come out of this talent code book because I think it's, there's a very good distinction on how training needs to take place, whether you are a lacrosse player or whether you are a you know, violinist, that's the one they use, or a musician, or even a golfer. And so what I'm going to do in the next, hopefully, five to 10 minutes is outline the ideas that are put across in the talent code and give my perspective on what that means for lacrosse, because he doesn't talk about lacrosse in the book. And so, but there is a very great representation of lacrosse that will allow us to add lacrosse into the discussion. So the first thing, and here's the, here's the other part about this is I opened this book. I flipped through it for about one minute and I read the book over a year ago, but I've, I've used the ideas in it occasionally. So Dan, Daniel, dude who wrote it. If I screw this up, sorry, bud. Um, hopefully you can correct me now that we're using Twitter. Cause that seems to be the you know, communication platform where everybody's chitty chatting and tweeting. So here's what I remember from talent code. When you are developing skill, there is a thing that you want to reach. So from a coach's perspective, we want to know what works. And the idea of what works really depends on the task because there has to be a goal. And if you can reach the goal, you would say that you completed the task. This actually goes back to the truth idea I talked about a little while ago. If what you tell me is true, it should help me get to where I want to go. Whereas if what you tell me is false, it's going to lead me down a path I don't want to go to. So when you lie, if you're being deceptive on purpose, it's not going to take you where it's not going to give you a representation of what reality should actually be. So how that relates back to this is that one of the things it mentions to do within talent code, talent code, where it breaks down all of the different expert locations is to, to chunk it, to repeat it and to learn to feel it. So in the book, it gives a bunch of different examples and I'm going to go through a couple and I'm going to explain what I remember from each example. So the first example is tennis. So in Russia, there is a place that they do tennis and they teach tennis and it's not well built. It's pretty rustic. And when people go to get trained in tennis, I want to say Anna Kornikova came from there and all these other people came from there the instructor will set the player up and will have them swing the tennis racket over and over and over again with no ball for a long time to make sure that their stroke is perfect because the spin you put on the ball and how you come through it, the if you can master the art of how you swing, 
you will be a better tennis player. So sometimes apparently kids don't even play for three months. They just continually do, they continually swing the racket and swing the racket and swing the racket. That's all they do. And once they get to the point where they can actively play, they are essentially trying to put this perfect swing into the same action over and over and over again. And that's the key is that it's the exact same action over and over and over again. It doesn't matter if you're on clay, if you're on grass, if you're on those little sports turfs or whatever. As you are swinging, you want to make sure that your racket is going through the ball at a specific angle because it's going to produce the best initial ability to get the ball to the other side. Now, in congruence with that, Along with that, there is the idea of coaches or of teaching players or not teaching players, teaching musicians. So there, there is a music camp where kids will go and they'll spend the summers and basically what the, the camp does and how they train these kids is they will cut up pieces of music into each specific bar. And as they cut up each piece of music into each bar, the players have to go into these rooms for two, three hours at a time, an hour at a time. I'm not really sure exactly the structure, but it's a long time during the day. And they have to pull out each bar of the music and they have to play the bar. So they set their tempo, they play the bar. And as they are pulling out each new bar of the music, they master just that bar, which you know, maybe it's a pause and that's really boring, but I I doubt they'd spend that long because it's pretty easy to master a pause. So that is the way that they will train it. Then when they bring them out of it, the kid who, or the player who has seen each bar should be able to master that playing all the way through it because they've seen and mastered each bar. But the key is that as they are doing this, it's the same thing over and over again. So you think about recitals when you think of, you know, I think of piano and a kid who I knew a long time ago who played piano, who taught me something kind of cool on the piano, but he used to do recitals. And so the only thing different about the actual act of being on a, on a stage is being on a stage, just being in front of people. It's the nerves of screwing up that will make it different. But where practice gets rid of those nerves if, you, if you've if you kind of succumbed to that. Now, the next thing we're going to go over is how people learn how to play soccer. So really quickly before we move on, I'm going to chunk some things into that. So lacrosse has portions of its game that many coaches, including myself, think about like they think about music or like this tennis idea. The tennis idea gets a little bit, you know, you can build on it a little bit more, but the idea that it's just you, you're the only one hitting the tennis ball back across the net means that there's, you know, that whole portion of the idea. So the the next thing we're going to talk about is soccer. So within soccer, Brazil took off I don't remember the time frame, 80s, something like that. But the reason that Brazil took off was because of a game called futsal. And if you don't know what futsal is, futsal is essentially indoor soccer with a heavier ball. So what they would do with this soccer game was they would just let players play. And as they let players play, a bunch of different new moves came out. And so one of them, I don't remember what the move, what they call the move, but it's basically where a player will come up and they'll impact the ball on the outside of their foot kind of to push it as if they're going to go that way. And their foot will spin around the ball and it'll go the other way. But so it's very fast. It's like tick, tick. And it, and it is a very good evasive move, but it came out of playing. And the idea behind this is that you can't take the act of playing soccer out of the game. It doesn't make sense to have them dribble without the game because the game requires the reaction. It's the same idea. There was a video a long time ago of this dude who's like the king of footwork and you see him in the sand and he's, you know, he's going all fast and he's like moving his hands and arms really, really fast and doing all that. And 
you put him in the same element with a player who can react to another person or uh, um, they have to see the lights. I know everyone sees the lights where they'll be on a wall, there'll be a bunch of lights and they got to go hit each light. That guy's much slower when he actually has to react to someone. And it's because your brain has different functions. Like you can learn muscle memory all the time, but until you are actually reacting to someone, it's not the same thing. So it doesn't make sense to train it outside of that. So as we are thinking about lacrosse, I see it as having both of those points. So there is a benefit to not hanging your stick inside if you catch the ball in the crease. There is a benefit to understanding how to walk the dog and engage your defenseman. But if the defenseman's not there, how do you know that you are impacting the defenseman in a way that means that he can't check your stick. So the conundrum in this book lies in what type of sport or what type of training are you doing? And my experience with how I learned the sport and watching Mark Millen do his stuff was that it was very technical. It was, this is the way you want to hold your hands. This is the way you want to, you know, shoot the ball. This is how you want to snap. This is what you want to do. But I was the one on the field imagining defensemen putting myself in a position where I was thinking through doing whatever I had to do on the actual field. So to tie in a whole other concept, the USA training facility down in the Springs, I've read a bunch of research on that where they talk about visualization and how they visualize themselves going through it and the mirror neurons within their brain actually it's the same exact representation as if they were going through it legitimately. So when they are thinking about running their race or thinking about doing that skill, all of the same neurons fire as if they were actually doing it. And so when you add that in, if you put a player on a field and say we're trying to teach dodging, I love teaching dodging with cones. I think it gives everybody a representation of where they're going to make the move. They're going to learn the muscle memory of what they do. If they hang their stick, I can tell them they hang their stick. But this would say that I should have them create a representation of a defenseman within their head and then react to the defenseman. Because as I mentioned in the take the players out of the vacuum video, when I do this stuff like Shake School produces, which is essentially being on a on a field with cones and we are you know learning all of the muscle memory once i become a defenseman for those kids i will overplay certain sides and they won't know what to do because they've never learned they understand the idea of going from cone to cone and what they should do at each cone but they don't under but but it's not integrated into their visual perception of what that is. So here's another cool thing about this whole posting on social media all the time. So TJ Buchanan, I hope I'm getting your name, the pronunciation right. He was the technical director of athlete development for U.S. lacrosse. And he has since moved on to world lacrosse. And he contacted me a little, um, well, he basically, someone shared one of my videos about 3VO, 3V2, and 3V3, um, teaching 2112 motions and as he looked at the video it was about the three vo's and so he wrote in and it was a comment on the european lacrosse coaches discussion group but he wrote in and he said you know this is okay but the player who is floating off the crease is going to have to have a representation of where the defenseman is and how to find space in that space like this isn't something that really works which is very true but he didn't know that I was building it into a progression where first they learn the movements of as far as where they're going to be and you teach the spacing and you teach all of that. And then you add in two defensemen and you're basically teaching what to look for after a slide is drawn and how the defense needs to recover as far as building the back end of what they should try to do versus just the just the 3VO, and then you build in the 3V3 where the offense actually has to draw a slide and then move it and beat the defensive recovery because now we're 3V3. So you teach it in those in, in that progression, and hopefully what TJ wanted in the first initial thought of it 
the idea of how you are going to have to map the space and find the space. It can't just be the catch and shoot. Hopefully that part happens. Now I see TJ's point where he's saying in a game, you have to have, you have to let him play because it, and it goes back to the same idea of soccer becoming great in Brazil is that these people, they were just allowed to play and that's where they had the ability to, you know, to do it. So as far as talent code goes, I would say that talent code has portions of both soccer and tennis that need to be replicated because the way a player accepts a ball and then can deliver it quickly is there is a way to do it correctly. Ryan Brown, he accepts the ball the same way each time he comes over it. All of Defy Athletics, same idea. All of the technical skill that that is, is being taught all over the country has to do with the idea of doing more with less time and being more efficient with each step because that's going to make you faster. That's going to make you better. Now, the thing that the soccer part, it probably says it, but I don't remember if it says it. It probably talks about nonlinear pedagogy, which is the idea that you essentially give a task to players and have them try to accomplish the task in whatever way that they're able to do it. So um, I was talking with uh, Sean Maloney today on Twitter and we were talking about some, he had, he had posted something and I posted the Einstein quote where he basically asks, there's a guy sitting at a desk and he says, in order to test what everyone does today, we will be doing the same test. We will be climbing a tree and you see all the animals there and there's the elephant and then the lion and then the monkey and then a fish in a bowl. And clearly the fish isn't going to be able to climb the tree. And that's the idea behind nonlinear pedagogy or, um, gosh, what else do they call it? It's basically free play. But so you give kids a task and they're able to attempt to do it in whatever way they see fit. It's not so cut and dry like the swinging of the tennis racket, right? But so I guess I would say that lacrosse has both sides, like I've already mentioned. Um, So the question then becomes at what stage of development should kids go from one spot to another? And I found a really great thing that I, I think I posted on Twitter as well, but it was the steps of the age groups for USA Hockey. And I believe it was six and under was me and the puck. Eight and under was, well, it was eight U, so it's technically seven and under. I hate the way that they, I hate the way that that's all, that that's done. It's weird. But so eight and under is me and my partner, 10 and under is, I guess, the beginnings of, like, we. And then I think 12U is, like, us. So there are different stages of development that keep coaches on track as far as where the players are in their physical and mental development so that the training that they receive is more beneficial for what they are doing. And I think that is, I mean, that's what everybody's, Everyone who I see who is thinking more in terms of youth development rather than how do I get my high school kids to be better as lacrosse, as how do I get them into college? What are they working on now? What are the colleges working on now so I can give my guys a leg up? Everyone who's not talking about that is trying to keep the youth coaches perspectives correct so that those kids have a better time because the worst thing you see is when a youth coach is trying to ask of a seven-year-old something that the seven-year-old cannot do and therefore the seven-year-old has a terrible time with what's happening and he quits and he doesn't enjoy the sport um it has to be fun it has to be something that they that they want to do So I think that was a relatively decent explanation of what that is. One second, YouTube. Sorry about that. That's freaking weird. I just had to check my thing up here. Um, But so, yeah, that is um, the live stream for today, I guess. And I hope you guys enjoyed it. Let me know if you guys have any questions. Remember to follow me or Palax on Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, and Twitter. 
we're adding all the social stuff because that's what Gary V said to do. If you don't know who Gary V is, look him up. He's a business dude who does all the uh, attention. Shane, you're very welcome. Um, I'm trying to think if there's any other things I can wrap up with. I guess for lacrosse, the main thing with talent code is that you can't take the player out of the actual experience of playing the game. So I think about my clinics that I run on uh, Saturdays right now and how they're very, you know, meticulous. Like for the defensive one, we do a lot of approaches. Like if you follow Rick Beardsley, he does that and he shows what he's doing. And very much of it is the same, but I'm sure that I don't have the same ability to correct the players as he does. Then when you think about the ability to allow the kids to play, if you're having them break down on a cone and move their feet in certain directions, sure, you're doing the muscle memory, but once again, you're not reacting to a person who is playing against you. So it definitely puts people into a conundrum. I would say that at from under from six and under, it might even be eight and under seven and below. It might be that you should focus more on the individual skills, not, not skills. Like don't break down the skills, but so case in point, I guess would be my nephew's soccer game that I referenced a little while ago. They're three and four and they're playing two on two on a 20 yard field with no goalies. And it's perfect for them because they just get to play. There's nothing that they have to go do. Then when they get a little older, they'll play five on five with no goalies. And then, but so as you watch them play the 2v2, they're all, everyone's just concerned with the ball. How do I affect the ball? Then I guess once they hit seven, they'll start thinking about how can I react with another person? And then that's basically all you're supposed to focus on during that time frame. Then it becomes about how can we work as a unit of like four or more. And so when you start to think about, and this is the thing that gets me is I don't care. Like a lot of times I feel like people use these platitudes and they start saying things like the quotes. I get it. Quotes are cool. I get it. They sound good. They convey a point, but they're dead. That's the thing is like, if you don't have the back end reasoning behind the life principles, they don't matter. So as people are trying to explain to coaches why certain things are what they are, having a reference for the actual research makes a lot of sense. Because if you, so as a coach, if I tell a high school player, you got to bring your best every day, you got to bring your best every day. That's what you got to do. They don't care. They've heard it a thousand times, a thousand times. They're going to eat you alive because they know that there's no substance there. Now, if you have them determine the goal that they want to achieve and you, and they actually do want that goal and you can convey how their ability to get themselves ready to compete each and every day at practice actively means something for their lives that's very different and that is something that i feel they would really appreciate and actively be able to to do like they they would appreciate the idea of building it out so this goes back to another thing that gary v talks about that i feel is completely underutilized and is almost on the way out based on this cancel culture stuff that's going on and this is something like i i i don't ever want to bring in that stuff into this but it does have it does have a very very good point how are you supposed to connect with players when you are not allowed to interact on an individual level with players so i see all of these these quotes of these great great coaches through time and one of the quotes I saw recently was like, the thing that was awesome about this coach was that every day he would get, like his players would hug him. Like it was just, it was great. Like Flip, if you don't know, like Flip Nomberg from CSU, everyone who knows Flip, I didn't get to know Flip. 
Not like I like to. I actually sent Flip a very conceited, stupid email once when I was going from Goucher back to CU. And it was like, it was just a conceited email. Either way, the point is, all of the people who knew Flip knew that he loved them. And there was that embrace that was possible back then. But now, with all of the kind of cancel culture and like everyone being so weird about any form of contact and all these lawsuits and all this stuff. It's just, it's interesting to see how you could actually connect with players on a legitimate life level without opening yourself up to the scrutiny of the mob. But so I guess that's a whole other, other theory. I'm definitely well into the woods here as far as the talent code discussion. But um, yeah, so I think overall the main idea is knowing and understanding when and where to put in all of the concepts that are within the talent code idea. I don't think it's a bad thing to focus on technique with younger players. However, there has to be the element of free play every day. It can't just be that. And so that actually brings some scrutiny to the clinics that I'm running now. And so the clinics that I really like to run at Parker are the train and play clinics because we can do a couple of skills and we can do things like that and then it's 45 minutes of play after 45 minutes of types of skills or games those are great because you really do get to see them actively play and that's that's the goal now the clinics that i'm doing now where we've got an attack clinic defensive clinic and midfield clinic and the ages vary it's very tough to give the entire group a good understanding or or to put them in drills that's going to serve all of them because they're at so many different levels so one thing that is much that is tough is that you can't really give them partner drills because a lot of times they'll be mixed up and one partner won't get the reps that they need or that they could have gotten without it so it's just an interesting dynamic to kind of see all the different players at once and try and make sure that they're each improving certain things at at either time. Either way, I hope you guys enjoyed the uh, live stream. Remember to follow on all those social media sites. Um, If you are on LinkedIn, definitely add me. Um, If you enjoy the Powlax content, leave a like and a review on, you know, I think that Facebook does them, Google does them and LinkedIn does them, but I would definitely appreciate it if you enjoy the content. Have a good one. I will see you guys in the next videos.